you for inviting me. And I'm thrilled to come and share with you some of our work that we've been doing at the San Diego Zoo Institute for Conservation Research. We've been hearing some really inspiring stories today, and hopefully I'll share one with you as well. Um, we all know that as humans continue to degrade and fragment habitat, more and more species are being extirpated from all or part of their historic range. And in order to prevent extinction of these vulnerable species, wildlife managers have turned increasingly to captive breeding, reintroduction, or translocation, moving animals from areas where they're being impacted to areas where they're protected, such as national parks, private conservation land, or reserves. Now, the goal of relocation is obviously survival, reproductive success, and ultimately to establish a viable population of your target species. But most uh, reintroductions actually don't meet these goals. In the first days to weeks following release, animals leave the release sites. You put them there, they take off. They are more vulnerable to predators if they're prey species, and some of them just simply have a hard time finding a way to navigate through our human modified landscape. So today, I'm going to share with you a translocation success story, talk to, you how, talk to you about how we approach relocation programs, how dedication and perseverance and collaboration, which we've heard a lot about today, um, can really help us bring those species back from the brink of extinction. Through my career, I've worked on a variety of different species and um, incorporating basic behavioral science into recovery of these animals. But today I'm going to share with you a story about a species that's near and dear to my heart, um, the endangered Stevens kangaroo rat. Well, these are totally different, but that's okay. Um, the slides are just, all the colors are off. Um, anyway, so uh, I was 22 when I was first called the rat lady. <laughs> it was really, I was taken aback by that at that age. and. Um, really sort of thought, gosh, I should have studied something huge and charismatic, like a wolf or a rhino. Um, but my father actually had talked to me a couple years before and said, you know, anybody can try to save an elephant because it's easy to convince people to do that. It takes a really special person to want to save something that most people think is a pest. Um, the truth is I got lucky. And kangaroo rats are rodents, yes. But they are awe-inspiring in their own right. They are not your typical rodents that you have running through your house in your kitchen cupboards. They're actually no more closely related to other mice and rats than humans are to monkeys. They, are, um, they live in our deserts, our grasslands, and our scrublands in western US and uh, down into Mexico. Um, and they're found nowhere else in the world. Everything about them is adapted to living in a dry environment. Their morphology, their physiology, and their behavior allow them to persist in these areas. So for example, they never have to take a single drink of water in their life. They get all of their water needs met metabolically through the extraction from their seeds, um, they, which really has served them well in the drought that we've had in California. They have excellent low frequency hearing, and they have co-evolved with owls such that they can actually hear the wing beats of a barn owl from a distance. And because they're solitary and territorial, they have to coordinate their mating activities with <coughs> other individuals, mostly at a distance. So they drum their feet to talk to each other through the ground. Super cool animals. They also play a critical role in ecosystem function. They are primary seed dispersers from the native plants that they um, they support, they are prey species for multiple predators, and they dig burrows, which their digging activities increase soil hydrology and nutrient cycling. So without them, literally, the ecosystem completely can type convert. There's a really nice study by Brown and Heskey in 1990 in the, in the um, Science Magazine that showed when you remove three species of kangaroo rats from an area, you type convert from a desert scrub to a grassland habitat, completely changes. So they truly are ecosystem engineers. They are listed endangered by the US Fish and Wildlife Service, by the IUCN, and threatened in the state of California. And they have an extremely limited range. You can see in the, in the orange there. 
That was in the 1980s. We have lost about half of that habitat to development since then. The promise was to put half of the, um, the occupied lands into reserves and give the rest up to development. And that's where we get our animals for translocation. If we're to save those individuals, we have to translocate them onto reserves. The problem is that the reserves that were established were not designed to support kangaroo rats. So what we see a lot of in California is invasive grasses. These are European grasses, bromes and, and oats. And they create basically a carpet out there. Well, kangaroo rats need open space to communicate to each other. They sand bathe on the surface of the ground, and they obviously need to be able to move through the landscape. So there are lots of problems that they're facing. Development continues. Reserves contain unsuitable habitat. And multiple translocations have been done with kangaroo rats that have failed. In fact, in one case, biologists moved 600 of them onto a reserve. And less than a year later, there wasn't a single one left. So it was a pretty doom and gloom situation for the kangaroo rats, especially for this species, the Stevens kangaroo rat. But what it had going for it was multiple folks across agencies that were interested in the recovery of the species. So my team at the San Diego Zoo Institute for Conservation Research got involved and took up the challenge of designing an effective protocol, a translocation protocol for this species that, that um, would take into account the species' behavioral ecology to try to move forward with recovery. We work within an adaptive management framework in which you identify the problem, you design and implement experiments, you monitor and evaluate your results, and you incorporate lessons learned. And this is an iterative process that keeps going around with every experiment that you do until you get to the point where you actually have an effective protocol. So I'm going to use uh, SKR, Stevens kangaroo rat, to illustrate this process. Now kangaroo rats are, live alone, like I said. They're solitary. They defend their territories from their neighbors, but they know their neighbors. So Duane knows that Amal lives over there, Susan lives next door, and Sophia lives behind them. And they're more likely to mate with those neighbors than they are with strangers. So, and the deer enemy hypothesis in behavioral ecology suggests that strangers are more of a threat to you than neighbors, even if you're solitary. And if you think about it, it makes sense. So neighbors are going to compete with you for food, but strangers are going to compete with you for both food and try to take your house. So I reasoned that if we moved uh, kangaroo rats with their neighbors, they would be more likely to survive following release. We went about the translocation process. We have to modify the habitat, as I said, because where we get to move the kangaroo rats onto the reserves, none of it is pristine habitat. It's all covered in invasive grasses. So we have to do something to open it up. We put in acclimation cages. We mark, observe, and recapture to bring, um, uh, to, to figure out who we're looking at and where they live. We bring them into holding. I don't know what's going on here. We bring them into holding, and we put them into soft release cages for about a week so that they can acclimate to the area. And then we put on little transmitter backpacks. I made these little backpacks out of candy necklace cord. Um, and we track them so we don't get to put on giant collars like you do with rhinos, but the tiny little backpacks, they don't make GPS yet for these guys. They're too small. So if somebody's interested in, in doing something with engineering, that would be a great place to go. Um, and then we go back out there and survey and see what happened. So we found that, sure enough, translocating them, oh my gosh, the colors are such a mess. But uh, so what you can see is translocating them with strangers, which is the, the left bars, um, they do much worse all the way across to a year. So these are the ones that are neighbor translocated. And uh, up until three, they, they, they are more successful, three times more successful by one year post, so if they're translocated with their neighbors. But more importantly for kangaroo rats is to see that reproduction in the wild. And strikingly, kangaroo rats that were translocated with their neighbors were 24 times higher um, in terms of their, the number of pups they produced on the release site. So this strategy was really the difference between success and failure of this program. And we repeat this process. As I said, it's sort of iterative. So that was one experiment. We wanted to 
identify some other issues. We had some other problems with the release. So like I said, predation is a huge issue when you're moving a, a prey species. We also have them leave the release sites. We wanted to figure a way to dampen dispersal. And then of course we have to modify the sites in to accommodate the kangaroo rats. So we went through a process of trying to figure out whether mowing, grazing, or burning would be a better way to, to move those animals. And we, we did experiments. So in this case, we uh, actually put out cougar urine to see if we could reduce uh, meso-predator visitation on our release sites and found that it works. If you release kangaroo rats into sites with cougar urine, you're more likely to have successful uh, releases. In terms of dampening dispersal, we put out kangaroo rat scent to sort of make it smell like kangaroo rats so they'd be more likely to stay there. And then in terms of mowing, grazing, and prescribed burning, we did all three of those treatments on large-scale translocation, and guess what? They like prescribed burns the best. And this is why. This is what the sites look like about a year later. This is a grazing site. It looks great when you first do it, but one year later, it's completely grown back in. This is what it looks like a year after the burn. It completely opened up, a forb release, a lot of diversity, the kangaroo rats love it, and it persists over time. <clears throat> so, as I said at the beginning of my talk, the most successful relocations are those that are, have interagency support and collaboration. Again, we've heard a lot about that. It's together that we can be most effective with these conservation programs. As everybody has said, landowners, land managers, the agencies, actually the politicians help a lot too, because they sometimes can bring the money in. And in this case, we brought in Cal Fire, and it was a win-win for them. They got to come out and do some training on our sites, and we got our areas burned. So it worked out really well. We also brought up prison crews to do all of our weed whacking. Um, so it was a, a very collaborative project. And for SKR, the ability to develop an effective translocation method has really saved hundreds and hundreds of animals. We have established six new populations, and um, if our progress continues and the managers continue to manage those habitats, in the next few years, we might actually see this species removed from the endangered species list, which is ultimately the sign of hope in conservation. Thank you. <laughs>